Hi, everybody, both in the room and uh, and online. Welcome to the second in our colloquium series on new work and concepts of health and disease. Um, and this week, it is my great pleasure to, to introduce Chris Borse. In our workshop last week, uh, someone said a really great phrase that I think cap captures Chris's role in, in this kind of literature quite well. And they said uh, that if, if all philosophy is footnotes to Plato, all philosophy of medicine is footnotes to Borse, <laughs> which I thought, I thought was quite nice. Um, the one other thing I should say before handing over to Krista to, to begin his talk is uh, is to thank the Salvi Foundation for kind of generously funding everything we do, including this colloquium series and this and this talk this evening. Um, we really couldn't do it without without that support. Um, shall I also check that everyone online can sort of hear okay and see okay? Um, could someone in the uh, attending online? Okay, someone says all good. Great, thanks very much. Okay, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Chris to um, right. begin his talk. Thank you. There's water here, and uh, this is the one for changing your yes. slides rather than the other. Yes, I'm going to sit. Uh, no disrespect intended, but it's easier for me if I can sit. Um, I would like to thank Professor Kingma and the Sowerby program and KCL for inviting me. Um, and uh, I hope that there is something in this paper that is of interest to the audience. It has a bit of a miscellaneous quality because it's replies, it's almost exclusively replies to recent critics. Um, but I, in my opinion, there are at least four or five interesting issues that we can talk about. And I would like to save roughly half the time if that's possible for discussion. And I'm particularly interested in the question of normal aging. Uh, how should, medicine view, normal aging. Uh, what should I say about it uh, is another question perhaps. So I hope we'll have a chance to discuss that. Uh, I do not want to spend most of the discussion period arguing about disability, even though the first part of this is, an, is a, uh, a reply to Amundsen's long ago 2000 paper. Um, so, you know, the, we can have a bit of discussion of that if you like, but uh, if you want to take issue with my statement that blindness is a severe handicap, then I have limited patience for arguing about that uh, because it just seems to me to be uh, denying reality to hold otherwise. All right, um, I'm a little bit unsure whether I should do the slides or read the text. Um, the text has been available for a couple of days. Uh, has anybody actually read the text? If you have read it, could you raise your hand? You have, okay, and, and you? So two out of the group. Well, in that case, I think I, I ought to try to read it uh, and, and see, how far, see how far I can get. Uh, maybe I'll read the first section and uh, see how long that takes. And if that takes too long, then I'll just switch to the slides. Okay. So this is new replies to critics. And um, I've lost these slides. <laughs> there we go. All right. And you can, you can think about why that's my first slide. It will become clear later. Okay, so um, as I say, all of these are recent critics within the last few years since I wrote the second rebuttal on health, which was published in 2014, um, except for Amundsen, who wrote this paper in 2000 called Against Normal Function. So now I'm reading the second paragraph. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Is the, is the volume all right? Okay. Uh, from Amundsen's title, Against Normal Function, one might, one might imagine some range of stronger or weaker theses to be defended. They include, one, that there is no such thing as normal function in biology, that even if there is such a thing, it either, two, is much less common than generally supposed, or three, is not or should not be, four, should not be the focus of medical theory and practice, because five, it is less important to the welfare of disabled people and doctors than the public suppose. In fact, Amundsen defends all of these theses except three, throwing in accusations of bigotry against me and medicine to boot. 
That is, he takes a maximalist position from the start and never restricts or qualifies it. Amundsen is clear at the outset that he means to deny the bi biological legitimacy of the concept of normal function. Current biology, he says, justifies no such concept. Instead, like race, it is a falsely objective idea used to ground social prejudices against disfavored groups. Like race, normal function simply has no factual basis in biology. And this quote from him, like the concept of race, the concept of normality is a biological error. The partitioning of human variation into the normal versus the abnormal has no firmer biological footing than the partitioning into races. Diversity of function is a fact of biology. And like race, normality is falsely used to explain and justify group differences in social outcomes. As with race, he writes, the disadvantages experienced by people who are assessed as abnormal derive not from biology, but from implicit social judgments about the acceptability of various kinds of, of certain kinds of biological variation. An immediate problem with this summary position is that it seems not just false, but obviously false. I should go on to Amundsen here. Oh dear, I forgot that too. Could I interrupt myself for just one second? I'm sorry, I forgot about this first, this slide. Um, I don't have a blackboard, do I? Uh, for those who are interested in keeping up with my publications, there are two recent ones that you may not have seen in somewhat obscure places. There's one called Resnick on Health in the Spanish journal Teorema. And then just this year, uh, a journal called Medical Research Archives invited me to give them something, and I did give them something on clinical normality. Um, there's also my reply to Wakefield's 2014 critique of me, which is coming out sometime in Journal of Medicine and Philosophy. There are at least three things that don't have a home yet. I've got two papers called Boundaries of Disease. One is on vagueness. Oh, that's wrong. Sorry. It, it should be risk, disease and risk. I, I mistyped. Sorry. The second one is on vagueness and overdiagnosis. And then I have a second reply to Wakefield on his harm criterion, which he just recently clarified, and how it applies to, in particular, one of his favorite examples of homosexuality. I also have planned two papers on human psychological nature. One of them is written, and I presented it in Buffalo. Uh, the other one is not written, so kind of a joke to list it there. Uh, but if anybody wants copies of any of these, you can just email me and I will be happy to send them. Okay. And my email, which is not on here, is cbours at udel, U D E L dot edu. Okay. So um, an immediate problem with the summary position is that it seems not just false, but obviously false. Indeed, immediately falsified by Amundsen's own recurrent examples of blindness, paraplegia, and sleepers, two-legged goat. Professor Kingman informs me that IJ is like E-I-L-L-E -L -L -E in French. So I'm just going to say sleepers goat. Uh, sleepers, two-legged goat, which you've probably not heard of unless you're a biology major or you read Amundsen. Um, well, um, yes, well over 99% of human beings have eyes and use them for some degree of vision. Well over 99% can use their legs for walking and well over 99% of goats are quadrupedal. In the relevant species, the lack of such functional ability is overwhelmingly atypical, which is what abnormal means. And if you don't believe me, read my 2022 paper. On anyone's analysis of function, including Emerson's own blindness, paraplegia, or caprine bipedality is a statistically rare lack of a specific function. Moreover, such rare functional deficits are precisely the kind that biologists automatically ignore in taxonomy. That is how an encyclopedia of ants can assert that ants invariably have six legs, though countless actual ants severely wounded in ant wars have fewer. If I'd been a little bit more foresightful, I would have got some slides of wounded ants. <laughs> If you just search Google images for ant wars, <laughs> you'll find lots and lots of videos and stuff, but I, I wasn't smart enough to do that. Um, but certain kinds of ants, anyway, are constantly having wars with other kinds. 
The claim is about ant types, that is normal ants, not defective atypical individuals. And for this purpose, it does not matter whether legs are lost in combat, fall off in disease, or never develop at all. There are no special biological facts that for blind pigs, diabetic horses, or bipedal goats. Biologists immediately recognize them as abnormal. Now, Emerson would surely reply to this point by citing his distinction between level and mode or style of function. He says high levels of function are possible for very atypical people when they use atypical modes of functioning. Thus, for example, blind humans can learn to read and braille. So neighbors do learn to walk on its hind legs, remodeling its spine and musculature to mesh, and wheelchair marathoners beat those on foot. In each case, presumably the atypical individual replaces the species typical mode with an atypical one yielding the same performance level. Thus, Amundsen will change his announced thesis, there is no such thing in biology as normal function, to abnormal functions can be just as good. Unfortunately, these examples again show nothing of the sort. First, the performance level is not, in fact, equal. Even for the specific task of reading, Braille is an inferior substitute for visual reading. Average reading speeds are markedly lower. And what slapers do learn to do was not to walk or run. But to hop like a kangaroo, but without the key benefit of a balancing tail. In available sources, there is no suggestion that this goat's locomotion was remotely equivalent to that of normal goats or even barely adequate for a typical goat life. And I tell you in the, of the history of the goat, it was a pet raised by a child, childless farmer's wife, and then a veterinarian named Slaper got hold of it and it became a lab animal. And unfortunately, only lived for about a year. Um, similarly, blindness locks not just in normal reading, but every activity requiring visual perception of the environment. It is not just difficult, but dangerous for blind people to navigate unfamiliar surroundings alone. And they are wholly barred from certain activities, such as driving. In fact, if it is one that their other senses grow more sensitive, hardly eliminates these functional deficits. Humans have no other modalities for perceiving the silent world at a distance. Without a new substitute fifth sense, like that seminar, blind people are hugely disadvantaged in all functions related to environmental perception. And blind animals and sighted species, blind animals and sighted species, lacking the technological and social support their human counterparts enjoy. I'm going to move this bit closer. Sorry. Oh, okay. They can't see me. The camera. There's a camera on this. Ah, oh, ah, okay. Sorry. Um, blind animals and sighted species lacking the technological and social support their human counterparts enjoy have drastically shorter life expectancy. In general, then, Amundsen's mode replacement thesis is false. The only one of his examples that even seems to support it is the fact that wheelchair marathoners can beat ordinary ones. That is, of course, true. And bicycle racers can beat all of them. And Stephen Hawking in a modified Ferrari would destroy the whole field. But Amundsen is ignoring the most obvious point, which we may call optionality. Marathon runners can race wheelchairs if they would choose. Paraplegics cannot choose to run, but only roll. Normal athletes have two possible modes of locomotion where paraplegics have only one. That, of course, is why they are said to be, quote, confined to a wheelchair, as Amundsen complains, even though the chair is, quote, a tool of mobility, not a confinement device. And we can also agree with him that all human beings use tools and live and build environments, but some human beings need more tools to live than others who have the option of doing without them. Moreover, a lack of functional versatility is directly relevant to health. The basic re requirement of health, on my view, is not part function, but part functional readiness. The disease of hemophilia is lack of plotting ability, not lack of plots. Bleeding, like the manifestations of many diseases, may be prevented with special care in a special environment, but the functional deficiency remains and is a case not of mere biological diversity, but biological inferiority. Whether compensated or not, blindness, paraplegia, and hemophilia are pure, uncompensated losses of typical functions in the species design. The issue of life expectancy raises another simple point. Amundsen does admit one class of phenotypes that could be called objectively abnormal, 
those that are not, quote, viable. He invites us to see a species as divided into lethal phenotypes on the one hand and a large diverse set of equally functional variants on the other. In reality, viability is a continuous variable. Even metastatic cancer does not kill a patient instantly and chronic diseases like diabetes or ALS can take a very long time to do so. Virtually, moreover, on virtually anyone's analysis but Amundsen's, biological functions are precisely causal contributions to fitness, in most cases via contributions to survival. Most severe deficiencies in typical part function, therefore, what I argue define the pathological, make severe reductions in life expectancy inevitable. If they didn't, the characters in question would not be survival-related functions in the first place. Obviously, low versus high life expectancy in a species' typical habitats is an objective difference, not a biological error. So ALS and terminal cancer are not just alternative lifestyles unfairly stigmatized by biologically ignorant bigots like me and the world's physicians. All right, I'm well ahead of this, I guess. So oh, there's there's uh, Slaper's goat on the top right, and bottom left is a kangaroo, and bottom right is a human being. Top left is a normal goat. The interest of Slaper's goat was for theorists of development. Um, it was very interesting to many people that the spine was remodeled to suit the bipedal gait and the musculature changed also in ways, but both of those in ways that were very similar to the corresponding parts in normally bipedal organisms like us or I guess kangaroos. Um, so the, the, the interest of the example in biology is, has something to do with the slogan form, follow, form follows function, form determines function, what is it? Form follows function, I guess. Um, so it is a relatively famous example, but the poor goat didn't have anything resembling a normal goat life. And there, yes, I don't know. I always have two minds about putting pictures from Google into my talks. When, when people, when I go to a talk that has lots of pictures, it always irritates me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to look at pictures. You know, this is philosophy, right? I don't want to look at just thinking pictures. So uh, on the other hand, if you find my text boring, maybe the pictures will be less boring. Um, so I, I threw in a, a few, but not a lot. Um, So I have a paragraph there on things I agree with Amundsen about. Maybe I'll just skip that. Um, um, and I'm certainly willing to concede that there's tremendous social revulsion, really. I would call it revulsion against handicapped people. Um, but I would not call these emotions prejudice, since unlike in Amundsen's view of race, they do not seem to derive mainly from false beliefs. On the contrary, Every educated person is aware of high achieving people like Helen Keller and Stephen Hawking. But Amundsen's goal in paper is to provide a scientific foundation for the most radical disability rights position, the social model of disability. This view holds that a person's quote, biomedical condition is never quote, the cause of that person's disadvantage. Instead, the cause is a feature of his environment, such as the lack of wheelchair accessibility. Morality, therefore, according to this view, demands that society change his environment to remove his disadvantage, else it is discriminating in the same way as it used to do with race and sex. For many disabilities, this is me now, for many disabilities, it is unclear that this program is even possible. No one has a clue how to rebuild the whole human life world to compensate for all the disadvantages of blindness. One would have to do something that amounts to curing it. And even where such redesign is possible, it is unclear whether 99% should be required at their own expense to carry it out to benefit the 1% regardless of cost. Perhaps this radical moral thesis can somehow be convincingly defended. What it cannot rest on, however, is Amundsen's use of biological pseudo-sophistication to deny simple reality with false charges of bigotry against those who tell the truth. Effective policies to help a group must be based on reality, not on lies about them, however noble. So I think that 
is the Amundsen. Yes, that's the Amundsen section. So how long have I spoken so far? 25 minutes. How much? 20, 20 to 25 minutes. Oh my, so from, from 505? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, well, that's what I was afraid of. All right, well, we better then go back to slides, I guess. I'm sorry, I didn't realize it was that long. Well, at least you finally have, after 22 years, you have a reply to Amundsen from me. But I put it off that long, partially because I couldn't understand how he could state the thesis that he states and then use these examples, which are obviously in violation of it, right? Three of his crucial examples immediately falsify his main thesis, it seems to me. Okay, if you haven't read his paper, read his paper. Okay, <laughs> now why are these two pictures here? On the left is a lion, on the right is one rendering of Swamp Man. Uh, so functions, just to clarify, I'm, I'm going to, re, I'm going to um, rebut now some criticism based on functions, criticism of my function account. On my account, a function is a causal contribution to a goal of a goal-directed system. Organisms are in fact goal-directed to individual survival and reproduction. So biological functions are SNR contributions, or briefly, I'll call them fitness contributions, which is the term that Garson, Justin Garson uses in his survey book. There's a very nice survey book by Justin Gar Garson, about 110 pages on the history of the function literature, supposedly going right up to the present. And uh, I recommend that to you. I read it myself in September to try to get up to speed on whatever has happened in the last 20 years of function literature since I last published something on that in 2002. Um, now, what I said in 76 and also in 2002 is anything that makes such a contribution has performed a function when X performs the function Z often enough, we say Z is the, or a function of X, or that X has the function Z. Hence, this is important, contrary to Garson, a part can have a function in a unique organism, such as my instant lions. In 1976, I, I said, suppose that the lion species just burst into existence by saltation. Um, and then after that, they, Donald Davidson took up the same theme with his swamp man example of a human being that I guess rises from a swamp with the same functional organization that we have. Um, Garson in a paper in philosophy of science called There Are No Ahistorical Theories of Function. And then again in his books says that my theory does not allow instant lion parts to have functions, but that's just not true. Uh, and he himself has been advocating individual, uh, indivi in individual specific functions. Um, for example, neural functions, that's fine too. My, my analysis covers that true. But um, in English, okay, so if you have individual functions, you could even call them normal for the individual because normal just means typical. So it could be typical of the individual. The important thing is not to confuse that with the medical use, the distinctive medical use of normal as the opposite of pathological. And that, I said, rests on comparing the individual to its species. So the swamp lines parts can have functions, they just can't have medically normal functions or pathology because they don't have a species. Now, do you want to hear this or not? This is my rant about what went wrong with the function literature of the last 20 years. And I like it, but yes or no, up or down? I can skip to the critics, up, okay. Well, according to me, there are two common fallacies which now pervade and distort function literature. Um, on my view, there is no, re no room for unperformable functions now sometimes called phantom functions, I believe. Functions are a kind of effect. Therefore, no effect, no function, period. 
Uh, this mistake goes back to Wright, Larry Wright's paper functions in 1973. He had the example of a uh, button on his car that uh, was, was intended to operate the windshield washer, but is broken. Well, he said that it still has that function, that is the function of that button, even though it can't do it. Okay. Well, he even said that it operates the washer. He said that's what it does, but it can't. Okay. Both statements are nonsense. Um, in 1976, in a footnote, I wrongly accepted the first statement. Then I said how you could paraphrase it to make it accurate. But I should have just denounced it as nonsense. It's, it's nonsense to say that the windshield washer button, that the button has the function of operating the windshield washer if it can't, right? It was intended by the car's designers to operate it. It may actually operate it in other similar cars, or it might have activated it before in this one, but it doesn't have that function now, okay? If you, if you want to talk about supposed to, it's supposed to have the function, but it doesn't. Right, and the ironic thing, or the, the the weird thing, is that no one otherwise ever confuses intended axes with actual axes. If you think about McNaughton, right, famous uh, famous insanity defendant, um, McNaughton uh, wanted to kill Prime Minister Robert Peel. He actually shot his secretary Edward Drummond. Uh, he was acquitted, of course, on, uh, by reason of insanity, and uh, the, the uproar over that led to the McNaughton rule or rules in insanity law. But um, McNaughton's actual victim was Drummond. Peel was the intended victim. Uh, and I say in my paper, if I decide that I just have to marry Kim Kardashian, right, then she is my intended wife, but that doesn't make her my wife. Even if we get engaged, even if she becomes my fiance, she's not my wife. She's my intended wife, right? There's nobody has any trouble drawing this distinction outside the function literature. Okay. And I say that it's exactly the same with organisms. Let's say Albert is in terminal heart failure and his heart cannot circulate his blood. It does not have the function of circulating its blood. No effect, no function. What this is, is the normal function of human hearts, which explains their existence in the species. And it's the past function of Albert's heart, but it does not have that function now, okay? Uh, everybody gets this wrong. Garson, in his survey book, has three desiderata for a function theory, one of which is normativity. He says normativity is the fact that it's logically possible for a trait to have a function that it cannot perform. No, uh, what he should say is that um, where there is function, there, there must be uh, the, the capacity for dysfunction. But this function is not having a function that you can't perform. Um, it's a lack or a low level of a function that is normal in the species for biology or intended or usual in this type of artifact for artifacts. Uh, and then the second thing I complain about, which are really two things here, I guess. I don't know if I should go through this. What's my time here? 533. Um, Let's come back to this if you want to talk about function pluralism, because I, I don't want to run out of time for the last topics. So I'm against the term Cummins function, and I'm against the function pluralism, which has now become the usual view. Everybody's now a function pluralist, and they usually say that they're pluralist between selected effect functions and Cummins functions, or CR, they call it CR for causal role functions. There's absolutely no need for this position, but I think I'm gonna skip this part because I um, wanna make sure we get to the others. Now, I am not in any way an Aristotle scholar. I read a few things about this topic. I studied Aristotle long ago, but I remember almost nothing about it. And I read a few things on this particular topic uh, and I found some very useful notes, one line, but uh, one, of, one of Wakefield's criticisms of me, of my function analysis in particular, involves Aristotle. In case you're not aware of this, in 2014, Wakefield published this blistering attack on my analysis of health in the Journal of Medicine and Philosophy, and that's what I've replied to in the paper that's about to come out. But 
in his uh, recent volume of replies to critics, which came out in 2021, this monstrous 650 page book of critics and his replies to them, he again attacks me. And this time he's criticizing my account of function. And one of the points, I'm gonna do two of his points and reply to them. One of his points is that my account of function is unfaithful to the idea which goes back to Aristotle of a natural function. So what's his position? His view is that medical disorder means harmful dysfunction. Harm is judged by social values. Dysfunction is failure of some natural function. What's distinctive about him, unlike other selected effects theorists, he believes natural function is a natural kind term in the Kripke Putnam sense. Um, that it, 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 the, the concept is based on a set of base cases, just as the uh, water in the rivers and streams is your base case for water, but um, things in rivers and streams that are wet and <laughs> slake your thirst wouldn't have to be water. That's not what the concept of water is. The concept of water supposedly uh, is whatever shares the essence, the explanatory essence of these base cases. So he wants to say that the explanatory essence, of, well, the, the base cases for function for biological functions are things like hands and eyes, you know, and legs that are mysteriously uh, so well adapted to human life. Um, but the explanatory essence turned out to be evolution by natural selection. Okay, so uh, it's not, it's not, evolution by natural selection is not part of the lay, you know, non-scientific historical concept of function. But what is part of it is the idea that it has an explanatory essence. And Darwin then discovered that the explanatory essence was in fact uh, natural selection. So he thinks that this picture goes all the way back to Aristotle, not just people like Harvey, but all the way back to Aristotle. Um, and I have two criticisms of this. In the first place, it seems a little bizarre to me to call biological function a natural kind. It's not very similar to the natural kinds that I'm familiar with, the usual examples like chemical elements or compounds or elementary particles. Or species as formerly understood be before Hall and others taught us that species are individuals. Um, but the second objection is, it seems to me that he's completely wrong about Aristotle. Um, he says, in a quote that I'm about to show you, that Aristotle's final cause is the unknown explanatory essence now known to be natural selection. Uh, based on my very limited knowledge, this seems to be an impossible reading of Aristotle. Here's the Wakefield quote. Aristotle understood that in explaining such a puzzling phenomenon as acorns growth into oaks, there are two different causal explanations required, efficient and final. Everybody's heard of the four causes, you know, Aristotle's four causes, efficient, final, uh, formal, what's the word? Efficient, final, formal, material, right? Fourth one is material. Okay. Um, There are two different causal explanations required, efficient and final. Aristotle had no idea of the details of either explanation, but understood that both types of explanations must be involved. The efficient cause of the acorns turning into an oak tree is a standard causal explanation of how it works. That would be what Bourse's theory uh, takes to be the function. But he says, what is lacking here? How the acorn's nature explains its capacity to grow into an oak tree is one major scientific mystery, but it's not the only one. Aristotle saw the second scientific mystery, and perhaps the more profound one, is to explain what in nature shapes organisms to have parts with the specific causal powers that enable them to produce such design-like effects and contribute in such unlikely ways to S and R. Okay, the problem Darwin addresses is analogous to this Aristotelian puzzle of final causation, which is the second order causal puzzle of what causes organisms to have efficient causal properties that are instances of biological design. So the explanatory essence, 
which is which turned out to be natural selection, he says, is what Aristotle had in mind by final cause all along. But as far as I know, you can dispute this if you if you like, of course, uh, this is completely impossible reading of Aristotle. In the first place, there's wide agreement that cause is a bad translation of it on. Only the efficient cause of the four seems anything like our idea of causation. And many people have suggested that explanation is a better uh, translation. Um, but the key thing here is, as far as I am aware, Aristotle has no origin story for the universe. So the idea of an unknown efficient cause of organisms nature, uh, natures is, is, off, is alien to Aristotle's worldview. He actually says that the final formal and efficient causes coincide for organisms. So in effect, it seems to me Wakefield has invented a fifth ition, the efficient cause of final causes. You know, what caused final causes, right? In, this, in the individual sense, you know, the, what, what drives the acorn to become an oak. Um, by contrast, it seems to me a goal contribution view of functions fits Aristotle's text quite well. The, the organ, the ergon of an organ is its contribution to the organism's telos, right? And we discover what that is by seeing what it does in species members today, right? It seems to me a completely natural uh, uh, analysis of a Aristotle's idea of ergon, um, whereas Wakefield's is impossible. All right, then the second criticism he makes that I wanna talk about is the normal range. This goes all the way back to Neander. Um, Neander, claimed when she first wrote her famous function paper that the selected effect approach to functions could do something that other approaches couldn't, namely it could explain what the normal range is for any function. And even before Neander got this into print, uh, I guess one of her colleagues or uh, fellow Australians named Pryor, Elizabeth Pryor, published a paper saying, no, it isn't, <laughs> no, it can't. Um, you still need statistics. Evolution doesn't, doesn't establish a normal range at all. And I agreed with Pryor in my critique in 2002, or my rebuttal, I should say, in 2002. So how does Wakefield, finally Wakefield has said how this is supposed to work. He says, the obvious definition of the normal range is the range outside of which there is significant negative selection pressure. Okay, so inside the normal range, there's no significant selection pressure. Outside the normal range, there is significant negative selection pressure. But it's just false that there is no significant selection against medically normal values. Um, and I found two sources online on this. Uh, one was a paper on evidence for stabilizing selection in humans, which found significant selection in height, body mass index, pulse rate, and blood pressure. Uh, for example, men five, nine or less had an average lifespan of more than uh, of five years more than men uh, greater than five, nine in height. And if they were less than five, seven, they lived seven and a half years longer on average. Um, that's certainly a significant difference to me. Um, but all those values are well within medically normal limits. If you're five, seven, nobody will call you a dwarf. Uh, if you're six feet, nobody will call you a giant. So it just seems to me that that's straightforwardly impossible. Um, there's plenty of significant selection within, um, within medically normal ranges. This is a diagram that you see in lots of places of what stabilizing selection does. If you start with one bell curve and then selection comes in, what it does is narrow. Um, narrow the bell curve, and therefore make it higher in, at the mean. Um, so it compresses the bell curve, but it doesn't eliminate it. And so, um, of course, um, what is significant is, is vague anyway. Um, but the definition that he gives is just impossible. Um, and uh, I wish I didn't have to do this, but at one point Wakefield scores a palpable hit <laughs> on me. He catches me in a mistake. I misinterpreted, I misstated my own account in 19, in, in 2014. 
which is really stupid. Um, what the account said in 1977 is normal functioning in a member of the re reference class is the performance by each internal part of all the statistical, statistically typical functions with at least statistically typical efficiency, i.e. at efficiency levels within or above some central region of their population distribution. And then later I said that, you know, that central region can only be chosen arbitrarily. Well, that's true in a sense, but it's got to be at least 50%, right? The, the central region that of, of the typical has got to be at least 50% because you can't have more than half of a population being atypical. That's just wrong. So it looks like I fell into, but, but in 2014, I, I said that, um, oh, did I leave that quote out? Um, I said that it could, that uh, the prevalence of dysfunction on my account could be anything up to 50%. Well, that's just not true. It, it couldn't possibly be higher than 25%. And the other thing I often say is that what is pathological on my analysis is much less function than typical or function far below typical level. I left those words out of the official statements, but really they should be in there. And in fact, they, they diminish vagueness, not add to it. All right. So those are two answers to Wakefield criticism, but also a correction of my error. And most embarrassing, more embarrassing still, that's the second time I've made a mathematical error in print. The first time I mislabeled one axis of my bell curve, <laughs> I put the label on the wrong on the horizontal axis when it should have been vertical or whatever. And now I've done it again. Right? <laughs> now I've committed the weathercaster's fallacy. Um, why, why the weathercaster's fallacy? Because at least in American TV, if you turn on the local news, you're practically guaranteed to see somebody saying, uh, the high today was 79, normal high is 75. Okay. That's false, right? That's the average high. Uh, but it's not normal for temperatures to exactly hit their average. That's completely abnormal. Similarly with height, you know, if a person of exactly average height is abnormal, not normal. So it's just a confusion. It's a misuse of the term normal, say I. All right. Um, in my opinion, one of the two best criticisms of me ever, uh, originally due to Professor Kingma, uh, both of them, in fact, originally due to Professor Kingma, is the attack on the choice of reference class. And recently, other people have taken up her lance and are riding with it, um, namely Nicholas Binney and Wakefield, too. Okay. Yes, good. I, I still have time to get through this. All right, so the, the, general, the general charge is that, my, that I have no justification for the reference class in my account. I said a natural class of organisms of uniform functional design. In her analysis paper, Professor Kingman goes through each of those words and says that, you know, this doesn't answer it, this doesn't answer it, this doesn't answer it. Um, and Wakefield picks that up too. I agree, I, I concede on that. Um, you can't take that phrase and uh, reach uh, the, the reference class that I that I stated, um, and Kingma asked why shouldn't there be reference classes of blind people or diabetics or Down syndrome or homosexuals or whatever? Well, the answer I am now I am now emphasizing. I also made it was one of two answers I gave in 2014. My my current favorite is it's all biology. Okay, the answer is biology chooses this reference class. Um, biological taxonomy rests on species, subspecies, sex, and developmental stage. Um, that's exactly, those are exactly the factors that I used, except I said age instead of stage, and I relativized old normality of the old to their age group, as well as uh, uh, immature fewer forms. Biologists don't have, I think, um, senescent types, uh, but they, they only have developmental stages. But that means if you, 
if you started judging aging adults against young adults, then the reference class of medicine would be exactly the same as the reference class of, uh, in biological taxonomy. Um, the fact is taxonomists just don't subclassify by pathological conditions. Taxonomy ignores nosology. And as I argued it in 2014, I guess it was, uh, at length with quotes you know, from biologists, species description in biology presupposes a normality concept. Just think about ants. Here we get to the ants, right? In nature, there are ants with any number of legs, right? If they go into their ant wars and they get torn apart, you know, they may have five legs, four legs, three legs, two legs, one leg, or zero legs. Okay, but um, biologists disregard this. They certainly do not define subspecies. Um, I made up some imaginary names in the paper text. They don't define six subspecies of ants or seven subspecies of ants. Um, instead, I had a quote in my 2014 paper from an encyclopedia of ants, which said flat out, ants invariably have six legs. Well, what does that mean? It means ant types, i.e. normal ants. Of course, actual ants don't invariably have six legs. Okay, now, um, I would say the best critique of me in the last few years is two papers by Nicholas Binney um, on osteoporosis in particular. And these papers are just jam packed with medical information. And what Binney seeks to argue is that current medical definitions of osteoporosis do not use my reference class. They disregard it in multitude of ways, beginning of course, with the fact that older women are compared to young women. Um, I just suggested that maybe that should be the, the general line uh, on senescence. Uh, but oddly enough, older men are also compared to young women. Sometimes a pathological reference class is used. Uh, in children, pediatricians, Benny documents, correct body bone mass density scores for all sorts of things like pu pu pubertal status. Why can't I say that? Pubertal status bone age, height age, body size, muscle mass. And worst of all, Benny claims that sometimes physicians use health adjusted reference classes, which would flagrantly violate the BST, uh, even if the other classes are explicable. Health adjusted reference classes are cl reference classes determined by physicians knowing in advance who's healthy and who isn't. Benny thinks that's a fatal a fatal blow to the BST. Sometimes physicians use several reference classes at once. And he says that all of these decisions are pragmatic in the end. They are driven by concern for fracture risk, which is what they really care about. Uh, not anything about comparison of the patients to a natural class of organisms, as the BST says. Well, I'm going to have to write a full paper replying to that to those two by Benny. Um, but and I certainly have not uh, even started on that, but it seems to me there are two clues to what I'm going to say. First, it's very important, and I make this point in the uh, paper on risk. No, no, in the in the paper on vagueness and overdiagnosis. Yes, I guess, or maybe it's in both. The paper on vagueness and overdiagnosis, incidentally, is a comprehensive reply to the Australian women, Rogers and Walker, um, who did some extremely interesting work on boundaries of disease. Um, anyway, if you specify a range of a clinical variable like hypertension or uh, you know blood glucose or uh, bone mass density, it can be any of three things. It may be the definition of a disease. It may also, it may only, it, it also may only be diagnostic criteria for a disease that you have defined otherwise. And there's example, an example of that in uh, the Rogers and Walker paper, where they say that, uh, uh, I guess it would be urologists, uh, define urinary tract in infection, UTI, by levels of colony form colony forming units per milliliter of sample. Well, in fact, if you look into it, the definition of urinary tract infection is just any 
bacterial multiplication in the urinary, urinary tract. The reason they have these measurements of CFU per milliliter um, is, to, is to exclude contamination. When you take a sample, especially by the simplest method, you're very likely to get sample contamination with bacteria that were not in the urinary tract. So that's th those are just diagnostic criteria. They're not a definition. And then I argue in the risk paper that what we have now for hypertension, the different you know classes of, of blood pressure uh, are just three treatment thresholds. They're not diagnostic criteria. They're not the definition of a disease and so on. Um, and then it's also important to note that most clinical tests are not direct or even fairly direct measures of function. So my guess is that the pediatrician's use of Binney's extra variables is intended simply to find the proper measure of bone function uh, rather than to change my reference class. The rest of the problems, it seems to me, derive from a focus on treatment and even cost-effective treatment. This is, this is taking longer than I expected, I'm sorry. Um, Benny's sources are not trying to define a disease of osteoporosis or even set diagnostic criteria for one. How do we know this? Because there isn't any analytic link between disease and medical treatment. I call this the therapeutic fallacy. Uh, the first rule of medical ethics is supposed to be to do no harm, but obviously whether the treatment is justified depends on what's available. And there always have been and always will be probably untreatable diseases until very recently, rabies and metastatic melanoma were obvious examples. Now, prion diseases are in that category. Um, so you can't say that to, to, to merit actual medical treatment is a test of disease. If it were, conditions would be constantly going in and out of disease status as treatments are discovered or lose their effectiveness. But to say that a condition merits ideal medical treatment is basically to say nothing. I mean, you know, any bad thing means ideal medical treatment. Um, at most, you're saying it's a dysfunction, right? If that's what you think medical, medical treatment should be directed at. At most, you're saying it's just a dysfunction, but um, otherwise you're not saying anything. But the silliest thing of all is to think that disease status depends on whether government has funds to treat it, right? The cost effectiveness, right? In that case, you could eliminate all diseases by just eliminating the health budget, which is nonsense. So my conclusion is that they're not trying to define a disease. They are trying to do something quite different. All right, last topic, old age. Obviously there are two possible views of normal aging, by which I mean the general functional decline in middle and old age, which occurs in most organisms, but not all. There are immortal or potentially immortal organisms such as some plants uh, or the hydra, um, famous hydra. The two possible views are the one I took in the BST, that it's medically normal because the reference class is age relative. And I thought that that was what medicine had traditionally said. So that's why I did it, uh, as well as because of course, the, of course medicine does it with immature forms, children and babies. Um, or you could say it's still pathological, even though it's typical of these older age groups, it's still pathological by comparison to old people with young adults, right? Not children, but young adults. And that's the, uh, the line that's being taken in the osteoporosis uh, diagno diagnostic criteria. Both views yield uncomfortable results. On the first one, uh, after a certain age, uh, uh, it's normal for men to have a cancerous prostate, which is too big to pass urine. <laughs> that seems ridiculous on its face. People have hit me with the cancer example many times before, but Wakefield, I guess it was, pointed out that benign prostatic hypertrophy is an even better example. So that's, uh, that sounds weird. And for that matter, if you were going to be consistent about age relativity, it ought to be normal to be dead after a certain point. And people objected to me. People made that objection to me early on and I just dismissed it. But, you know, thinking about it today, I think, yeah, maybe that's being inconsistent. Uh, on the other hand, if you compare old people with young, young adults, menopause seems to be pathological. And 
old people face a torrent of accumulating diagnoses like chronic kidney disease, which now is defined in such a way that after a certain age, most people have chronic kidney disease. But there's, a, there's been a lot of concern about something called overdiagnosis, the harms that can be done by diagno diagnoses, even if they're true, uh, including the mental suffering that people have when they're told they have a disease. Okay, so that would militate against taking line two consistently. Um, the, uh, the interesting question to me is what kind of question is this? What, when Kingma and Binney and uh, Wakefield demand a justification of the BST's reference class, what would count, right, as a justification of it? Um, in any case, there's also the possibility that the issue is at least partly empirical. There are two main groups of aging theories, damage accumulation and evolution, or that is program senescence or death. According to the latter, the evolutionary accounts, typical aging could have a function. An example is the grandmother theory of menopause, the hypothesis that after a certain age, women can best spread their genes by helping their grandchildren, not by having new babies of their own. Uh, in that case, menopause would have a function. Um, it's also possible that senescence in general is the unavoidable byproduct of earlier function, this is what Griffiths and Matthewson in their recent paper suggest. Um, there's a concept called antagonistic pleiotropy, uh, where a gene is selected for the fitness advantage it confers early in life at the cost of disease later in life. To me, this sounds like the inhibition of one function by another at a single time. It's, it seems parallel. And if so, I would think that the, my theory should count it as normal. Um, whatever you'd have to do to reference class to make that happen. What I do not understand is why Griffiths and Matthewson think this is evidence for the superiority of a selected effect analysis over a, a fitness contribution analysis as the foundation for medicine, right? Because the, in that case, this pleiotropic allele has a fitness contribution function and whether it was selected for it is irrelevant. And I don't see that any of their examples support their conclusion. Their thesis in the paper is that SE is better than FC for founding medical concepts, but I don't see that any of their examples actually does this. So I began with an ant, I end with an ant. This slide I believe was given to me after a Buffalo talk by someone who thought that it shows a five-legged ant, <laughs> if you look closely. I can only find five legs for this ant. So maybe this is a five-legged ant, but if if it isn't, then just go to Google Images and look up ant wars, and I'm sure you'll find as gory uh, pictures six, of. Six you can see six shadows. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. I only see five shadows. One, two, three. Or should I, should I, you know, just because like I like to make a point of disagreeing with you? Yes. You know, it says one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> okay. Well, then I don't have an illustration. Thank you, Professor Kingma. I see. I see that you deserve your chair. Well, I, th I think that the person that sent it to me thought this was five like an ant. But in any case, you know. Trust me, there are many ants in the world that are five-legged, four-legged, three-legged. I don't have pictures, but they're there. And if, as I said in 2014, if you can't find them, you can make them, right? I wouldn't do that because I'm too nice, but little boys do that. Take an ant and pick off the legs. Um, but nobody thinks they belong to subspecies of ant. All right, well, I took longer than I expected to, even cutting one of my gripes about functional literature. But that's an hour, so probably I should stop.